What was the point of any of that? And then, to prove that they care, they made him only a little bit uglier. Uh, Mr. Crit, enough ranting about Mundo. Let's get back to the topic at hand. In your infamous tweet, you called the rise of the Sentinel cinematic, and I quote, Eh, it's fine. But that was before you released a rant calling it, and I quote again, a f***ing dumpster fire in a later video. You have a duck that censors swears here? I'm using these. We are aware of that. Anyway, what was the sudden turn of events about? How did you arrive at that shocking conclusion? Your Honor, you see, it all started a few weeks after the ruination ended. Well, and so, with, um, quite the finale, the Sentinels of Light event has reached its conclusion. And, as we predicted, while the details of the story often ran into brick walls, the overall story, as scary as it sounds without context, was fine enough. And that's really only if you forget that half of the champions happened. But even so, was the conclusion good enough to carry the entire event? Well, that's what we will explore in today's video, as we go into the good and bad sides of the Sentinels of Light. Your Honor, the defense attorney is obviously just stalling for time to add more ads into the video. Can we skip the intro? Mr. Crit? Uh, yes, Your Honor. So without further ado, let's get into it. The king will return for it. Then I will strike him down. Even before people started data mining accidental sentinel files in Wild Rift, it was obvious there would be some kind of a ruination event. And from the data mining, it felt like we would get an event with a much more serious tone. An exact counterpart to what we saw in Spirit Blossom. An event worthy of the end of the world. Of course, that's not really what happened. But more about that a bit later. What didn't help the beginning of this event is that the ruination has been coming for quite a while at this point. It's been 9 months since the Ruined King was revealed and six months since the cinematic that set up the entire story arc. So unfortunately, as big as the hype was after the Ruination cinematic launched, six months later, people just got tired of constant teasing. And what was worse, originally the Ruined King game was already supposed to be out. And we were already supposed to have Vex as a playable champion. But without these two, we essentially had six months of nothing. Now, on one side, one could argue that it wasn't entirely Riot's fault. The entire world was pretty much on fire, literally at times. And so the delays happened because it was difficult to coordinate with outside studios, and even internally within Riot games. This meant that when Riot had to change Vex from an artillery mage to a classic mage, that change was way more difficult to pull off. That's why delays happened. And that's where the real issues began. With all the delays becoming unavoidable, Riot got into a position where they had to release something. They needed to follow up on their release schedule. Viego was out, three months after him we got Gwen, then we were supposed to get Vex. But since that wasn't an option anymore, the focus went on to Akshan. But Akshan was the key to the conclusion of the entire Ruination storyline. And so, at the same time, they had to start pushing the event out as well. So now we were getting too much setup, none of the payoff, and after Spirit Blossom, everyone was waiting to see if we could get another big summer event. And that's the thing. The event was ambitious. But it was within the scope of Riot's ability. However, that was before time started playing against them. With a delay of at least 3 months, the event could get back to the Spirit Blossom standard. But the Ruination hype was already vaporizing, and 3 more months would have killed it. There was no going back. The train was already moving, and Riot had to build the tracks as it ran forward. Reckon it's time. For a reckoning. Straight from the bat, the event felt good. We immediately jumped into an introduction where it became obvious that Riot was going to use the tech from Spirit Blossom and adapt it to the Ruination. A feature which nobody complained about, since the Spirit Blossom dating sim like conversations were a massive success. But whether this adaptation of the conversation system would also be so memorable? We would learn a bit later. 
Before that, we arrived at the first issue which really crippled the first impressions. The event felt grindy. Whether it actually was is debatable. It really wasn't difficult to unlock everything in a reasonable time. But the point is that it simply felt grindy. And you felt like you were being forced into playing 7 games per day. And when it comes to these systems, the feelings matter. That's what drives first impressions. Overall, the idea of this event was great. We got a map that showed us that all the different regions were under siege by the Black Mist. And one by one you chose in which order you wanted to save the regions. And depending on the order you chose, you unlocked different ways to earn points to progress through the other regions faster. For example, the first week you could decide whether you wanted to recruit Riven from Noxus or Olaf from the Freljord first. If you went with Olaf first, you got extra points for taking down turrets as a team. And if you went with Riven first, you got extra points for dealing physical damage. And here's the thing, the order which you chose could actually affect your grinding times quite a bit. It was very easy to get points for taking down structures as a team. It wasn't so easy to deal physical damage to your enemies reliably every game. This meant that you could min-max the speed out of this event. And there was an optimal route to unlock all the things in the shortest amount of time. While, I'll be honest, it was cool to see the community developing a meta around this event. It really didn't help the event feel fun. It started feeling more like a chore. And what was worse, you could only gain points for the progression by playing PvP games. Quick co-op versus AI didn't work, and neither did TFT both of which previously worked for Spirit Blossom. So yes, the event felt grindy. Thankfully, after week 2, Rad realized that players weren't really happy about knowing that it took around 12 games per region to go through the event. So during week 3, they released a hotfix which added in a new mission. This mission awarded 600 points, which was about quadruple what you would normally get per game. All you had to do was to play one game to complete it. The mission was infinitely repeating. And it now also worked for TFT. So by releasing this mission, Riot essentially took months of their work and threw it into the bin. Now it didn't matter in which order you completed the regions. It didn't matter how well you did during the games. It didn't matter what games you played. All the time spent developing the progression system was wasted. At that point, all that mattered was that you could complete the entire region while playing a single game of TFT on your phone on the throne. And while this was universally a welcome change, it still invalidated the entire adventure which we were supposed to have. I understand, Mr. Crit, Riot wasted their time working on a system which would essentially be scrapped. But surely that doesn't mean the entire event went into the bin. It's been worked on for years. Even if one developed part was removed, the rest of the event should still be a solid experience and- About that. As mentioned, for the most part, the event was fine. But as things went further and further along with the story, even those who are not interested in the lore started to feel things were weird. We, as the main character, got a teleportation gun. Which, granted, can only teleport sentinels to a platform which the sentinels had built themselves. So I can let the technology slip. Remember, the sentinels are based on the Blessed Isles. And their mages could use teleportation. But curiously, Lucian somehow didn't know about this being a thing. Even after becoming a veteran sentinel. Then a holographic magical projection pops up, and once again, Lucian is confused. How is this possible? I myself have no idea. But things got weirder than Riot giving the Sentinels a teleport, just so they can quickly move around the world during the event. So far, the main marketing were the cinematics, and those alone threw off a lot of people. There was the cinematic where Vayne fought Shivana, Lucian and Senna appeared, and together they defeated her. But in the visual novel, Lucian and Senna found Vayne in a ruined pub, where they teamed up, and together they found Shivana inside a Mage Seeker compound. 
where somehow patricide is entirely worthless. And the entire point of the Masia being a massive anti-magic fortress is entirely ignored. At the very least, patricide absorbs magic and with enough power it can morph items and buildings. But none of that ever happened. And Galio, the titan who's woken up by magic being present in the city, is never even mentioned. Regardless, now we had two versions of the story. One in the cinematic and then one in the visual novel. So why don't we throw in a third one? While all of this was happening, every week Riot released a chapter from the Ruination comic. This comic series followed the same storyline, but since it was promoting Wild Rift, it only included the champions who got their skins in Wild Rift. And even there, the encounter with Vayne happened totally differently. There, Vayne actually tried to kill Sana, calling her a monster, which is an interaction we haven't seen in either the cinematic or the visual novel. So this event essentially had three different versions of the story. And people didn't know which one was canon. Why do I have a feeling like he's gonna pop off? Ah, please get ready, Mr. Duckington. Don't. Let him rip. Before the event was revealed, when we only had the skins on PBE, Riot confirmed that all the skins were canon and that all the skins represented the champions and their stories. So going into the visual novel, everyone expected everything the champions say to be canon, just like it was stated. But then, oh, after a bit of backlash at how silly the characters behave in some scenes, like Olaf farting in Ionia so he wasn't allowed into a temple, ha ha ha, we got a correction. And now it wasn't exactly canon, it was just a retelling of the main story. And then we were told that some people interpret the word canon in different ways. What? Canon is canon. How is anyone actually f***ing confused about that? Good job, Duckington. If it's canon, that's how it happened. Word for word. That's all we wanted to know. But the scariest part came when they explained how the story was structured. We were officially told that the visual novel was canon. The cinematic was just a retelling of the Demacian chapter. And the comics were a slightly different version of the story because it didn't have all the characters. So now, since the visual novel wasn't exactly canon, we didn't have the canon story. To this day, we legitimately don't know how things actually happened. And on top of that, Wild Rift had its own event with a simplified version of the visual novel. And there, the characters behaved totally differently. At that point, all I wanted was a bit of consistency. Your Honor, I respect that cards have not been dealt in Riot's favor. The world was really not having it at times. But that doesn't justify the damage that had been done. Mr. Crit, perhaps you should do what you believe would be best. It sucked! I don't know what happened! Mr. Crit, I didn't mean for you to drop a diss track on Riot. Oh. I was hoping you could perhaps try and find something good about this event. Ah, right. Okay. Despite what many people may believe, it's really not difficult to find the good parts of this event. In all the areas where Riot is good, Riot is really good. First of all, the one thing at which Riot's mastery is undeniable is music. We first got a tease of what the Ruination theme was going to be at the end of the first cinematic. And just like was expected, of course, the Sentinel theme was awesome. But that's not where it stopped. This theme was later altered to be used during the visual novel, and it really set up some heroic moments. Especially the victory theme. On top of this, we got new altered versions of the other themes, which served as moody background tracks. And with these, just like Spirit Blossom got its fair share of really iconic moody scenes based around Lilia's theme, here we got Gwen's action theme, her sad theme for when Senna gets depressed, Viego's creepy theme when things got creepy. Viego's dramatic theme when he went insane. And we even got the classic action theme. And this strange one was eventually revealed to be part of Vex's theme. But of course, there were many more. Simply said, once again, the music department nailed it. <laughs> they sure did. Can we go back to that diss track real quick? 
connected to this from a technical level, the visual novel was an improvement over the Spirit Blossom version. During Spirit Blossom, all conversations were linear and every time you had an option to say something, the conversation would sidestep before collapsing back into its place. During the ruination, whenever you had the chance to say something, sometimes your response opened up a new conversation path with its own separate choices. Of course, eventually it would also collapse back into that one path, but at times you could have double the width of the Spirit Blossom conversations. And when it comes to the technical presentation, the ruination also surpassed Spirit Blossom. Here we got double the amount of sound effects for all the different things that happened during the story. So anything from Targon crumbling, to Riven fighting with a bucket, to diving into the seas with Pike. It all had its unique sound effect. And it also supported far more sprites than Spirit Blossom did. Here we got numerous new side characters as well as new enemies. And we got more than three times as many unique backgrounds. I counted them personally. Spirit Blossom got 17 and the Ruination got 60. Riot was able to do this because they could just alter some of the already existing art. When it comes to the story, believe it or not, it did actually do some really cool things. It evolved certain champions and put them into places which absolutely made sense for them. Despite Vayne's story playing out in three different ways, her outcome at the very end of the story was cool. Unlike all the other Sentinel champions who decided to return to their normal lives, Vayne decided to stay as a Sentinel and represent the Sentinels in Demacia. This absolutely makes sense for her character. Her life was ruined by a monster. That's why she became a monster hunter. But over the years of killing monsters out of hatred, she slowly lost her purpose in life. The Sentinels gave it back to her. And on top of that, she could keep killing monsters. Another storyline that concluded in an interesting way was Irelia and Riven. While Riven was always open to teamwork, Irelia refused to fight alongside her. She remembered her from the Noxian invasion. And so, despite Riven trying to atone for her crimes, Irelia deeply hated her. But by the end of the story, after seeing how much Riven tried to bury her old self in all the good deeds, Irelia recognized the pain inside her and the two became sparring friends. The conclusion to their story became an amazing tiny bridge between native Ionians and the deserting Noxians. Also, even though Akshan is not the most interesting character, him shooting Isolde was a really great twist that perhaps scarred Viego more than we thought. We will probably learn more about that when he eventually breaks free, in a distant MMO. And by the way, the fact that Viego's heart was healed and he stopped spewing out the black mist because Akshan killed the one who killed him, that was also a really cool moment. So yeah, if you look beneath the surface, some of the inner stories were great. And this was especially shown in the Wild Rift version of this event. It didn't focus on the overall story, what Viego was doing, and how the event concluded wasn't really even mentioned there. But instead, it focused on the champion's mental state during this horrifying war. Especially the scene where Senna visited her own grave marked with a lamp was incredible. Whoever was responsible for the narrative take of Wild Rift nailed it. Lastly, we can't take away the one thing from the ruination that made this entire event more fun. The game mode. The one where you picked a champion and you could choose an extra ultimate from another champion. Now, personally, I still believe that Star Guardian and Odyssey were by far the best game modes League of Legends has ever had. But damn for the PvP scene, the Ruination was the best. Far better than something like the Bilgewater Brawl or whatever the Blood Moon got. Though, to be honest, even though we got new models for the monsters, it's a shame it didn't take place on a new map. Your Honor, the defense attorney is obviously just trying to play into our emotions. They're reminding us about the good things before they talk about the bad things, so that the bad things look less bad. We've seen this trick before. They should get back on the topic and explain what made them snap. Your Honor, that guy really wants to make me snap again. Mr. Crit, you know that you're on this trial because you swore in a video on a family-friendly channel, right? So that's why the duck is here. Well, I really didn't want to come back to that. A lot of writers might have taken it personally, and I would really hate for that to happen again. But if you insist, let's talk about 
the bad side. We have already mentioned some of the bad things surrounding this event. The event feeling grindy. The event having three different versions of the story. But there is more. We mentioned before that just like Spirit Blossom, the ruination also had the illusion of choice. Meaning that no matter the dialogue options you picked, eventually it all collapsed back into the main path. Well, the thing is that for Spirit Blossom, the illusion actually worked. Because you were the one forming your own relationships there. You were the one directing the story. The fact that you didn't really do that was hidden really well. But since here, we were supposed to get a canon storyline. From the very beginning, you knew no matter what you said, the story would always continue in its canonical way. You knew your decisions didn't matter. On top of that, what happened to the tone? I remember when I first saw the event hub. This image was actually data mined in Wild Rift weeks before the event launched. And based on this image alone, with the high contrast shadows cast over the characters, I thought this event would be a dark version of Spirit Blossom. I was really getting Darkest Dungeon vibes. And yet, that didn't happen at all. Instead of getting a dark setting for a really dark story, we got Spirit Blossom. Again. Everything was lighthearted, a few serious moments, but eventually everything would return back to jokes. It was the same thing again, but at least it did fit Spirit Blossom. When Cassiopeia tried to kill you, it was funny to joke about how you enjoyed it when she crushed your bones, because you were in a comedic environment. That tone was set for you at the very beginning of the event when Lilia got you naked. When it comes to the ruination, when the sentinels traveled to the Freljord, Vayne constantly slapping you didn't feel funny because we were facing the literal end of the world. Not to mention, Pike's only drive in this story being him checking if people are on his list. Also, him joining the Sentinels was just another joke. They really could have placed any other champion here instead of him. All of these jokey bits amalgamated in one big flaw. Despite the ruination being all about Viego waging war on the rest of the world, the event didn't really feel like a war. We never heard about any of the regions fighting back. We didn't hear from any of the other major champions involved in leading the regions. The Triforix never did anything, despite Swain having the power to see everything. We got stories about Hecarim heading to the Masia, and how they had to let Jarvan know what was happening. But then, Jarvan never did anything either. We did see Shivana though, who is somehow in the middle of the Masia's capital. Even though she was supposed to be around Renwall, in the mountains because she can't hide her draconic side. Like, we actually don't know why Shivana was there. Was she in the Mage Seeker compound because the Mage Seekers locked her there? Or was she put there simply because that's where the Sentinels were heading? And there had to be some kind of a boss fight? In Ishtal, we were told that Kiana did have a canonical reason why she wasn't there. I guess that will be revealed later. But the Shadow Isles didn't have Maokai or Karthus. Not to mention Yorick, whose story, which was written to be the conclusion to the Ruined King's story, wasn't the conclusion to the Ruined King's story. The Freljord didn't have any of the tribe leaders mentioned. The Kinku didn't help Ionia. And Azir's almighty sand soldiers certainly didn't help in Shurima. But all of this is rooted in another problem. The reason why this event didn't feel like a war was because the visual novel could only show up to four characters on screen. But for an actual war, you need to show proper legions of defenders. This means that for an event like this, the visual novel really wasn't the right choice. They should have picked a better format. In fact, this event tried to do something better, but they never properly leaned into it. The only time I felt like something was actually happening with the regions was when I looked at the map. No, not that map. For some reason, Riot did nothing with it, even though they could have shown the mist actually floating around. Instead, they ignored it. What I meant was the map in the hub. There, as you progressed, you saw little pawns moving around. But that's really where it ended. It just showed you where the champions were at that moment in the capital cities. 
Which was quite pointless, because you had no say over where to go or what to do on the map. Which would have been a feature that would have actually felt like you are playing a strategy game during a war. But alas, instead, the map was just a visual guide to help you understand the story. Which wasn't hard to do, considering the fact that there wasn't much story to explain in the first place. But on top of all of that, for some reason we got to play through the story from the point of view of a sentinel known as Rookie. Once again, just like it was in Spirit Blossom. It's not a bad idea to play our own character instead of a champion with their own canon story. But here, it doesn't make sense to play a side character, because even the side character is crucial and canon in the overall story. So choosing their dialogue doesn't make sense. Riot even gave Rookie a literal teleportation gun, so without them the Sentinels couldn't do anything. And yet, to this day we still don't know if Rookie is canon. They never appeared in the cinematics, and without Rookie, the fast traveling around the world wasn't explained in the comic either. So what's happening with Rookie? We don't know. And speaking of Rookie being a strange out of place character, after playing through the regions, it quickly became apparent just how unnecessary some of the Sentinel Champions were. If you removed Olaf, Rengar, Pike, Graves and Diana, the story wouldn't change. So it became obvious these champions were literally added in just to have skins to be sold. And funnily enough, it was shown how unnecessary they were in the comic. Because there, none of them were present. And the story still happened just fine. And somehow, there the story happened without Gwen too. The one who was supposed to banish Viego on Kamavor at the very end. And the brilliant cherry on top of all of this is that, yes, it was cool that all the champions of 2021 were supposed to be related to the Ruined King story. But for some reason, every single one of these champions was a sexy attractive character. The Ruined King, a shirtless emo boy. I have to admit, him being a young inexperienced ruler was a brilliant subversion of expectations. We all thought he would be some plumpy bearded king. Nope, shirtless emo boy it is. But after him, we got Gwen. We thought she would actually look like a doll that came to life. Not a sexy human after which you would model a doll. But sure, she's fine. But after her, we got Akshan, a shirtless Jojo character. Like, have you seen the original concepts? Have you seen what Akshan could have been? Just why did we go back to this? And after him, we got Vex. Yeah, sure. She's not a sexy, attractive character. I think. But god damn, I would love to get a proper, serious character to fight in this war. How is it possible that all the side characters that were created specifically for this event are far more appealing and interesting than any of the champions we got? I literally want every single one of these as a champion, instead of any of the other ones we got. And this takes me to the main issue. The main plague that really caused the downfall of this event. A thing which you can't ignore, especially if you want to keep this game and its world growing. There were fundamental things about the lore that were bad. Uh, Mr. Crit, you keep saying that the lore was bad, but bad is quite a relative term. Don't get me started. <laughs> oh, you better get it started. Different versions of a story don't automatically render all of them bad. Was that really a reason for you to swear in a family-friendly video? I'm gonna do it. He's gonna do it? You need solid evidence to prove that the lore is not accepted by anyone. Mm. Oh yeah, baby, let's fucking go. What do you mean? All the evidence is right here. We were told it was canon, but that was just a lie. So I cried and fortified my anger with the question why. Why was there plot armor in all the different cases? And why were all the champions in all the wrong places? Why wasn't Vayne hostile towards Xena? Why did they use fans when they could have asked Jenna? This is not how I wanted things to be at all. <laughs> what a goofball. Bonetization of the ruination. Decapitation, blow to riots, recreation. Worth validation. Of the Lord's devastation. So why Pike and Graves and Rengar, not Jace? At least he would have had a really cool hammer. But that's the problem. It feels like they shoved in random champions for their new cool sentinel weapons. I can already imagine the bitch meeting.
We are going to the Shadow Wars to stop the king, but we don't need an army, just marketing. The premise is cool, the expectations high, so no Yorick Mori, no Maokai. We established story, what is that? Let's give a godlike power to an acrobat. Serious tones, the world's ending? No, it's just jokes or misunderstanding. Mr. Crit, I don't think you have enough evidence. Unless you bring up something else, I will be forced to... Well... Devastation of a nation, questioning association, education, levitation, put armor, imagination, conjuration, meditation, preemptive humiliation, separation, fragmentation, revival of consolation, dissipation, hesitation, ignorant impersonation, implication, liberation, curious, exaggeration, augmentation, defecation, unlikely negotiation, invitation, termination, and telecommunication, explanation, dedication, images of desperation, validation, indication, multi-level translocation, speculation, destination, unwelcome ramification, agonizing publication, Involving hyperventilation, celebration, vegetation, not explaining preservation, declaration, inspiration, maybe discombobulation, penetration, mutilation, and oversimplification. But most importantly, monetization of the ruination. Maybe Arcane will restore the reputation. This weird narration should get some explanation. Did anyone wonder what would happen if we just let Diego revive his wife? Your Highness, I am done. This is the last straw. The lore is really where everything falls apart. There are simply a lot of things that didn't make sense. Objection. None of it made sense. Mr. Nicky Boy, aren't you supposed to be disagreeing with him? Ah, who cares about him swearing in a video? He's right. I fucking hated the ruination. Yeah, it was bad. It was trash. Like, did anyone pay attention to what actually happened? Akshan having the power to resurrect people with a sentinel gun? Eh, sure, I guess. It's a magical world where spirits and the magic realm interact with each other in such a way that it would be possible. Maybe when a killer kills someone, they get tainted by the soul of their victim. If the absolver then kills the killer, it returns the soul to the victim. Sure, that can be explained. But even with that logic, why did the absolver revive Sana and Gwen? The visual novel hinted it's because Isolde ripped the souls out of them to revive herself. Therefore, Isolde killed them both. But that's not what happened! Viego was clearly the one who ripped the souls out. He was the one who murdered them, not Isolde. So how does that work? Then, what about Olaf? The skins were supposed to be canon, right? So why is Olaf missing an eye? I get it, it's so he looks like Odin. No, not that wimpy guy, the real Odin so Olaf's skin would actually sell. But still, you could have at least given him a reason to wear the eye patch. Maybe it was some kind of a wraith-seeking sentinel device. Or, you know, Olaf only cares about his glorious death. So since Rengar got a new glowing eye out of nowhere, why in the story didn't Olaf give Rengar his own eye? That would have been such a good story. But now, it's just nonsense again. And what about Diana? The Sentinels recruit an actual Celestial Demigod into their ranks. And the Demigod just stands by and occasionally hits one or two wraiths. It's not like Diana can call down the burning white light of the moon, disintegrating entire armies in a blink of an eye. Nope. Here, one of the most powerful beings on Runeterra, literally, didn't really do anything important. Even though she could have tried to commune with the Twilight. A Celestial who is an expert at banishing dangerous beings. The Celestials could have done what Gwen did at the end. And speaking of Gwen, how did she find the Sentinel headquarters? In her story, she started on the Shadow Isles. She traveled across the entire world. We assume she did it on her floating scissors. And with no idea where to go, she just followed the mist, which was scattering across the entire world but she happened to pick the path that led her directly to the Sentinel HQ. What are the chances of that happening? Then, did anyone notice how in the visual novel, Vex used an ability which she was supposed to have before her kit was reworked? In the Freljord, when she fought the Sentinels, just like the other really cool character, she summoned Shadow and slowed everything around her. The story mentioned how even bullets flew slowly around her. So in her original kit, she was supposed to be able to slow projectiles. If that's the case, I can understand why she was changed. I don't think the spaghetti would be able to hold that together. But regardless, the visual novel didn't even reflect on what Vex was being turned into. The list of these strange mistakes just keeps going on and on. But what's the weirdest thing by far is the main plot of this story. Why didn't we let Viego get back his old? 
If he got her back, he would be happy. And the ruination would have stopped. There was literally no reason to fight Viego back. And worse than that, why did the Sentinels fight Viego? They learned that he was trying to resurrect his queen. And the only reason why the Sentinels mercilessly beat Viego was because Sana had a piece of the queen inside her and she didn't want to let her go. The ruination was a messy war because Sana didn't let Viego have his love back. I mean, sure, Sana would likely die without Isolde inside her. But really, Sana wouldn't sacrifice herself to literally save the entire world? What kind of a plot is that? Like, yeah, sure. Viego is a spoiled brat who became a king. As he looked for the pieces of his wife, he simply enjoyed using his power. And so he corrupted someone every now and then. But was it worth to start a whole war instead of letting him toy with a couple of people as he looks for his old wedding gifts? I just don't think the entire plot had the right motive. And this brings us to the magnum opus of this event. The main side story. Which obviously became a setup for something big in the future. Human Thresh. Objection! This is a really old topic at this time. I don't think we need to waste any more time with this again. He's already talked about it. I've already talked about it in my own video. So did I. Oh yeah, I did too. It's like an hour long and I still need to do part two. Ugh. All right, yes, I know. Human Thresh didn't really start as something people would like. And even now, people may think that Human Thresh was an absolutely bad decision. But out of all the bad things, I think there is more behind this. You see, in the comic, Riot carefully put Thresh in to let us know that everything that happened to Viego was according to some kind of a plan. Thresh was the one who showed him the waters of life. He was the one who let him try to resurrect Isolde. And even though this was never directly shown in the story, in the comic, it was confirmed that a thousand years after the Blessed Isles got ruined, it was Thresh who decided to bring Viego back. Remember, the Ruined King has not been around for the past thousand years. The mist was active, but something was holding Viego back in the heart of the Shadow Isles. So, if the Ruination was Thresh's master plan all along, it makes sense why he was the one to absorb Viego's mist at the very end. Thresh's entire story was leading to the point where he would become more powerful than the Ruined King himself. This seemingly human form was the reason why he allowed the Shadow Isles to be created in the first place. The issue is, even though all of this sounds cool, we only learned about all of this by piecing together all the tiny details. And that's because we are missing one massive context. We are missing the Ruined King game. Which, in case you don't remember, Thresh will likely be one of the main characters of. If you listen to the trailer, at the beginning, you may notice that the story is told through Thresh's perspective. So I believe the game will focus on Viego's resurrection and what was Thresh's real plan with him. That's why Unbound Thresh looks like a weird decision. It's because it is supposed to be the outcome of the Ruined King storyline. But without the game, we don't have the context just yet. Uh, weren't you supposed to mention the bad parts of this event now? Yeah, the splash art f***ing sucks. The old one was horrible. The new one has a noble idea. But the perspective on the face is wrong. It looks like it was photoshopped on from another picture that has a different angle. I see. Well, I think we've heard enough. Since we can't get Mr. Crit to stop swearing, I hereby announce that this court has no outcome. Quite frankly, I don't even know what the point of this was. People swear in family-friendly content all the time. Have you seen The Incredibles too? Oh, so that's it? I'm free of all charges? I mean, what did you expect? We're a bunch of sprites and VTubers. We don't have any real power. Well, in that case, let me end this session with one final note. It's interesting to see that despite all the technical issues the event had, the real downfall of it was the story. It was the story which people didn't like. And it was the story that received the most burns. Meaning that, in reality, people care about the lore. They care about the stories behind League of Legends. The times when people blindly accuse League's lore of being bad are long gone. The story has been amazing for years now. And this, this is the proof. The proof that people care because they want the story to stay good. So how did Viego revive a star constellation that was light years away? God damn it! <laughs> <laughs>